Hi everyone. With this video, I want to walk you through lesson five of my high calling in Christ. My high calling is Christ witness. Let's begin with a prayer for the Lord to bless us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to consider how we can grow in our life as your witnesses and the promises you give us to help us. We ask that you would embolden us and enable us to be your witnesses for the spiritual and eternal good of many and for the glory of your saving name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at five simple ways to be Christ witness in this lesson, beginning with number one, simply going to church. So we're going to take a look at number one, what was a key priority in Abram's life? If you want to pause the video and take a look at those verses and draw a conclusion, um, please do so. Okay, I think you probably came to the realization pretty quickly that worship was a very important priority in Abram's life. He lived among pagans who worshiped false gods, and yet he fearlessly and lovingly worshiped the true God publicly as a witness to the people around him. Um, this is the God I worship. Um, this is the true God. This is the only God who is a savior. So we're going to springboard from that to question number two, which is, how are you a witness simply by going to church? And that's followed by three other questions. If you want to pause the video and formulate some answers to those four questions, um, please do that, and then we'll pick up and discuss a little bit. <clears throat> okay. Okay. If you had a chance to think about those questions, um, let's just recap. First of all, how are you a witness simply by going to church? Um, well, everybody in your neighborhood who sees you leaving at 20 minutes to nine on a Sunday morning, uh, you know, you're dressed pretty decent, you know, maybe not uh, like you're just uh, gonna work in the yard. Uh, they probably assume you're going to church. So you're witnessing about the importance of God in your life, about the importance of God, period, to people around you in your neighborhood. Uh, maybe your next door neighbor, if they have questions about God or uh, problems in their life, or if they, you know, are simply looking to connect with a church, will ask you, you know, where do you, where do you go to church? Or even better, why do you go to church? So you can tell them the reason uh, in Jesus. Secondly, how are you equipped to be a witness in church? Um, there's probably a lot of ways to look at that. Uh, but the chief way is that the word of God is proclaimed in church. And it's the word of God that gives me a message to share. Maybe it's a, a sermon on forgiveness. And I think to myself, you know what? I know somebody who really could use this message. So um, you're better prepared to share that message. Or maybe it is simply that your own appreciation of the gospel is made deeper and stronger by hearing about Christ's love for you and his forgiveness for you and his gift of salvation and his help in every trouble for you. And you're inspired by that, right? Um, the best witnesses are people who appreciate themselves, what the message of the gospel means and what Jesus' love for them means. And then do you, how do you get opportunities to witness at church? I think that that really can be answered a number of ways too. Uh, first of all, I am sure many of us have had people come up to us and share a problem going on in their life, an illness, some kind of difficulty in the family, maybe um, a suffering loved one. And in all, of those in all of those situations, we have an opportunity to share the comfort of Christ and his love and his promises. So you have opportunities that way. Um, there might be a 10th grader in church who is hearing in his biology class every day that he's a product of evolution. And you have an opportunity as you confess in the creed, along with maybe 50 to 100 other people, uh, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that he's not alone in what he believes. Um, somebody in the previous class has also mentioned visitors that come to church or guests. Um, my son and his wife are are joining a congregation in the Grand Rapids area primarily because, I don't know, maybe four or five people or couples the first time they visited came up to them 
and not only said hi, but actually engaged them in conversation and wanted to know more about them and, you know, welcomed them and invited them to come back. And within a week, they were having dinner uh, with someone from the congregation. So um, your opportunity to be a witness also is in how you greet people who come to church, um, giving them another, another reason to come back and hear about Jesus again, right? Um, and finally, how are you a witness, um, or how does it serve your witness to let others in your life know that you go to church? Uh, so we're talking there about maybe classmates, coworkers, people you recreate with, uh, people, um, you know, you just may uh, happen to come in contact with on a regular basis. Um, when we talk about the importance of letting them know that you go to church, what we're talking about there is letting them know you are a Christian, letting them know that God is important to you, um, they will assume you know something about God. And again, if they have spiritual questions um, or if they have maybe troubles and they believe that um, belief in God can help them, they'll probably go to you uh, for answers, for direction. Um, they might be the people who, having experienced a lot of troubles, are seeking God. And so uh, you'll probably be the person they go to. In the other classes, we talked about how it wouldn't be cool to say, hey, uh, did you see the Lions yesterday? Yeah, that was a great game. Um, I go to church. Uh, you probably don't want to be that abrupt, but you can work it in. I know one woman said, um, uh, once a week, I take off at lunchtime to change the church sign. And if I'm rushing out and people are like, why are you in such a hurry? Uh, she tells them, oh, I uh, change our church sign. And um, I'm kind of, it, it kind of is a tight schedule for me to do it during my lunch hour to get there and do that and get back. So um, she tells them that she goes to church and is part of a church that way. Um, you can tell them, hey, I went to a great uh, marriage workshop. Um, or you can tell somebody when they say, hey, can we get together on Sunday? You can say, well, it have to be the afternoon or evening because I, I go to church on Sunday morning. Uh, just letting people know you go to church is an important part of your being a witness too. Part two is inviting others to church. And uh, why don't you take the time to read John 1, 35 through 49, and then we'll talk about what we learn from this section about inviting others to church. Why don't you pause the uh, video and we'll give you a chance to read through that. All right, if you had a chance to read through that and think about that a little bit, the follow-up question is identify three things we can learn from Andrew and Nathaniel about inviting others to meet Jesus at our church. Um, I'm not sure if you, you caught this, but in verse 41, if you take a look at that, we're told that the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah that is the Christ. So I think the first thing is maybe to remember that there's some urgency to this. Um, I tend to be um, a person who can put things off easily when it comes to inviting others to church. Um, I might be thinking, well, you know, maybe Easter, that's two months away. Maybe Christmas, that's six months away. Uh, maybe the next Bible discovery class, that's, you know, probably three months away. Um, I'll look for an opportune time sometime in the future. Um, that is not what Andrew did. He immediately went and found his brother Simon to tell him, we have found the Messiah. Um, and then he brought him to Jesus. He invited him to come and see in Jesus what he had found in Jesus. Um, I think another thing when it comes to inviting others is that Andrew found his brother, Simon. Philip found his buddy, Nathaniel, who was also from his hometown of Bethsaida. Uh, so what does that tell you? Um, start with relationships that are already relationships of closeness and trust. So, you know, you're not going to be considered a weirdo religious fanatic if you go up to somebody you have known for most of your life um, and, and tell them, hey, you know what, um, would you be interested in coming to church with me? It's going to be a really great Easter service coming up. And um, I just wanted to give you an invitation because I think you'd really like it and, and get a lot out of it. So you start with people who are close to you. There's an urgency that's involved. And then I think another thing that's important is um, Philip told Nathaniel, hey, just come and see. Just check it out. So I think it's important for us to understand we don't have to 
to present some big involved complicated case about why somebody should go to church we can just invite them and say you know what i think you'd really get a lot out of it I, it's really helped me um why don't you come and see just give it a try um very non-threatening right to say just give it a try no pressure involved um, we're just asking people to see for themselves um, and then we trust the power of the gospel to convince them this is this is a message that's important in the little box to the right on the back of the second page, on the back of the first page, page two, um, there's a little bit of information about the percentage of unchurched people who would be at least somewhat likely to accept an invitation to church from a friend or family member. Uh, that's 50 to 55% of unchurched people um, who are friends with you or family members that would be willing to, you know, be favorably disposed toward going to church. So the big thing here with that statistic is, you know, you've got a coin flip chance of uh, being successful in inviting somebody to church. So those are pretty good odds, right? One out of two um, that somebody you know in your family circle or maybe among your friends might come to church if you simply invite them. All right, the second question in this section is, identify your biggest reason for not inviting someone to church and write down a one statement biblical argument against that reason. Why don't you pause the videotape and give yourself a minute or two to answer that question. Okay, if uh, you thought about that for a little bit, um, I'll tell you, I'll start, I'll start with mine. My biggest reason for not inviting someone to church is um, I don't want to be known as the weirdo religious fanatic next door who is pushing religion on my neighbor. Um, so that's one of my big reasons for not inviting someone to church. I think the biblical argument against that would be, seriously? So you, you're putting your fear of possibly being labeled as a greater concern than them spending eternity in hell. Hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, somebody in our class put it in um, a little bit different way when they said, why do I want to deprive myself? They used the same um, personal reason for not inviting to church. They also said, I don't want to be labeled as a religious pushy person. Um, but they said, why would I want to deprive myself though of the joy that comes in sharing the greatest gift I can share with people? So that's what we're talking about. There's a biblical response to every lousy excuse we have for not inviting someone to church. Um, and it's maybe important to analyze our reluctancy and our excuses against what God actually says in his word to get our thinking straight and to eliminate those roadblocks or obstacles. Finally, um, number three, what could your church do to help you invite someone to church? Uh, if, if you have ideas about how your church can help you invite someone to church, we definitely want to know about it. But something we do rather routinely is we provide invite cards to important services like maybe fall kickoff or Christmas or Easter or Bible discovery class. We um, have put just the sermons online. Uh, it used to be the entire service was taped and put online. Now we are including uh, not only the entire service, but also just the sermon so that if it's a really good sermon on uh, how to get relief from guilt, and you know somebody who's struggling with that, um, or how to bear crosses that come in life, and you really want to share that sermon with somebody, um, now you can just go to our YouTube channel and send the link, and boom, uh, you've helped someone maybe be more likely to come to church. Um, we also try to do a number of um, programs or events that will appeal to our community. So, you know, you've got the opportunity to invite people to marriage workshops or parenting workshops or uh, coping with grief or coping with regret. Uh, we do a number of Bible studies that just hit topics that people are interested in. So in all of these ways, we're trying to make it easier for you to invite people to church, uh, ultimately to come to know Jesus. Okay, number three. Um, third thing you can do to be a witness is just pray. Um, Abraham prayed that the Lord would spare the ungodly people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he prayed for the household of Abimelech when the women were not able to conceive. 
Christian love moves us to pray for God to be merciful to others and especially to be merciful to them in bringing them to the knowledge of Jesus, their Savior, for their salvation. So read the following prayers for the salvation of others. And when you read them, be thinking, what do they have in common? Again, uh, probably a good time to pause the video and read through those passages and do some thinking about what you see that they have in common. Okay, if you had a chance to take a look at those Bible verses, maybe something that jumped out at you um, is this. The classes from yesterday um, all identified these things. Uh, first of all, um, all of the prayers are centered on the forgiveness of sins and the gift of salvation. So you can pray and should pray for the people in your lives to be helped when they're in time of troubles, to be made well and recover if they are ill, uh, to get through difficult circumstances. But the best thing you can pray for someone is that they come to know that their sins have been forgiven through Christ and that they believe in Jesus for their eternal salvation. So most of the prayers are centered directly on that. Another thing people noticed is that the people praying for others prayed out loud. Um, so it's not just that they inwardly prayed, Father, forgive them or save them. Uh, they spoke that out loud because they wanted people to know about God's forgiveness and his salvation in Christ. Another thing, and that that's important about prayer, right? I, I pray for the salvation of others, but I also pray that God gives me the courage and the love to speak that message they need to hear for their salvation. Another thing people noticed is the willingness to sacrifice. Everybody who is praying is actually being persecuted by the people they are praying for. And it's interesting that um, there's this selfless love, this willingness to sacrifice for the spiritual good of others that's exhibited. Um, praying is a discipline. It's not easy to pray for the salvation of others regularly and diligently and passionately. Um, but the Holy Spirit works in us that willingness to do that. And not only that, but to, to get out of our comfort zone, to be willing to risk uh, certain things or sacrifice certain things to bring the gospel to others for their salvation. And I think you see that in, in all of these prayers. On to number two. Um, other than simply praying for someone, hey, Lord, bring them to faith in you. What will you pray when your passion is the salvation of others? Underline what you see in the following passages. And again, why don't you pause the video and consider the next three passages and jot down what you see about what you might pray for besides just, Lord, bring them to faith in Jesus. Okay, if you had a chance to look at the um, Bible passages, um, I think a lot of things are pretty clear and they jump right out. First of all, in Philemon 1 verse 6, the Apostle Paul prays that Philemon may be active in sharing his faith. So um, it is really easy for me to be inactive in sharing my faith, to be very passive and timid and uh, reluctant to share my faith. So Paul prays I hope and pray you will be active in sharing your faith. And that's something that we want to pray for ourselves and for our fellow believers as well, that we are not passive, not inactive, but active in sharing our faith because we need God's help with that. Um, Paul in Colossians 4 uh, really shows us two things we might pray for. Number one, Paul prays that God may open a door for our message. So that's praying for opportunities to share the gospel. I met a man who was a um, respiratory therapist who, who told me that every morning when he drives to the hospital, he asks God to put someone in his path that day with whom he can share Jesus. Um, you might be very surprised when you pray daily for God to give you opportunities to share the message of Christ, how many opportunities he gives you. And it will certainly open your eyes if you're praying that way. Uh, to those opportunities when they come, and, and you'll be looking for them more. Finally, Paul says at the end, pray that I may proclaim the gospel clearly as I should. Um, one of our biggest fears is that I'm not going to do a good job sharing the message of Jesus. It, I'm going to fumble around. It's not going to be clear. It's going to be all muddled and and uh, just dumb and off-putting. Um, Paul 
prayed that the Lord would help him proclaim it clearly, and he was the greatest missionary in the world. So all of us need help with that. Um, and it reminds us, I think, what we're beginning to see is that none of us are actually really good witnesses by nature, are we? We need God's help with that. Um, finally, uh, the Apostle Paul prays that God may give him the ability to pro proclaim the gospel fearlessly. And he says that not once, but twice in those two verses. Um, you know, you and I might think, oh, the Apostle Paul was a natural. He was the greatest missionary in the world. But this is a guy who, who had to pray for God to give him courage to speak about Jesus. Um, in the, I think it's first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said, um, I came to you with um, weakness and much trembling. He literally was shaking in fear um, at the opportunity and the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel to them. So if you're super timid and you're fearful about it, you're in pretty good company. Um, and like the Apostle Paul, you can pray for God to give you courage too. Um, finally, number four is make a list of reasons why it's good to pray for the salvation of unbelievers in your life every day. Um, a couple of things from the previous classes that I think are worth noting. Uh, one person said, um, I forget about praying for the spiritual welfare of others. <clears throat> I forget that I have a privilege to share the message of Jesus with them. So if you keep a little sheet of paper by your bedside and you write on that the names of uh, the people who are your Frank, um, that's an acronym on your study guide for your friends, your relatives, your acquaintances, your neighbors, and kids you may know. If you jot down two or three friends, two or three relatives, two or three acquaintances, two or three neighbors, two or three kids for whom you are going to pray that the Lord would lead them to faith in Jesus and use you as the person to do that, um, this keeps the spiritual needs of these people first and foremost in your mind. And then also you're, you're putting the spiritual and eternal welfare of others in the hands of the one who can actually do something about it. God, right? So, you know, all the pressure does not rest on you. Um, and you are asking God in his grace and power um, to, and in his love to help them come to him and know him. I think another reason why it's good uh, to pray for your friends, your relatives, acquaintances, neighbors, kids who don't know Jesus is it, it's carrying out what God tells us to do. So um, when he tells us, uh, proclaim the good news to all people, um, it helps us to do what God has called us to do. It's our mission. It's the great commission of the church too. So for all those reasons, it's good for us to pray for the salvation of unbelievers in our lives every day. Which brings us to number four. Another way to be Christ's witness is simply to be who you are. So rather than getting into a big fight over grazing land that would be noticed by all their pagan Canaanite neighbors, Abram let his nephew Lot choose where he wanted to pasture his flocks and herds, and Abram um, settled for the leftovers. And then Abram risked his life to rescue Lot and his family and many others in the community who had been taken captive by raiders in Genesis chapter 14. He was living Jesus' Matthew, message in Matthew 5 about living the kind of life, a selfless, sacrificial, helping, serving, loving life that has an impact on others. Um, I'll give you a second or two to read Matthew 5, 13 through 16. So if you want to stop the video again and read through those verses, um, we'll answer a couple of questions about them as well. Okay. Uh, so first of all, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Um, salt has a beneficial impact on things. When salt comes into contact with ice, it melts it so we can be safe on the road. When salt comes into contact with your popcorn, it brings out the flavor and enhances uh, the taste. Um, when salt is used to pack fresh fish, it's going to keep it um, from contamination. It's going to keep it fresh uh, before it gets to your table. So how would you want to, an unbeliever to describe the beneficial impact you have on them as the salt of the earth? Um, isn't it just that you want them to know you as the most loving, kind, thoughtful, helpful, willing to serve person they know? When I used to drop my kids off at grade school, often the last thing I would say to them as they exited the car was, be the biggest servant in your classroom today, uh, because that's the impact we want to have on others. We want Jesus' loving, serving heart 
uh, to be what motivates us and generates our lifestyle. Number two, um, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Light illuminates so that people can see what they could not otherwise see in the dark. How is your life as a Christian illuminating? That is, what does your life let people see? Um, in previous classes, the classes talked about two things. First of all, they said, well, um, your life illuminates what the gospel produces in people. So if you are content with your life, if you are at peace in troubled times, if you have joy when life isn't exactly great and people know your, your life is filled with struggle, um, if you have love for others um, that is unique and unusual and beyond what people typically receive from others in the way of love, all of that testifies to the power and impact of the gospel in your heart and in your life. But in the end, uh, the other thing people said is that your life reveals Jesus himself. Your life lets people see Jesus. And uh, it's an awesome privilege to think that Jesus lives in me and that people can even see a dim reflection, a glimpse of Jesus in my life and in my love for them. And then finally, number three for this section is, um, have you ever thought about how the life, your life of witness is tied to the Lord's prayer? You know, it's, it's really interesting. For example, when we pray, thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven, to have this calm, trusting approach to life that, you know, whatever God's will is in my life, I'm, I, I'm good with that. Um, and I trust that he is guiding my life for good, even in times that, that seem pretty dark, like God may have um, just let me go and let bad things into my life without even caring. When you can remain humbly confident and trusting and say, with your heart and with your life, his will be done. I trust him because he's my loving savior. People notice that. Um, the other petition, give us this day our daily bread. When you're content with what you have just for today and you're not worrying about tomorrow and you're not freaking out like people around you, people notice that. When you are forgiving um, of your enemies, um, because you've prayed, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When you so appreciate God's forgiveness for you when you were his enemy and, and act like it with your sin, um, so you love and forgive others like Jesus has forgiven you, people will notice that too. Um, when you don't give into temptation, but when you are driven by um, a strong set of values and principles and morality and ethics, because you're a Christian, people notice that too. So when you say, uh, lead us not into temptation, um, and you actually try to avoid sin and temptation, um, certainly trusting God to help you with that, um, people notice that too. So all of those ways evidence that, you know, when we just are who we are as Christians, when we just live our faith and the love of our Savior, um, we are his witnesses in maybe ways we don't even realize. And that gets us to number five. We're going to wrap up with giving away what you have in Christ. This is another way we um, can be Christ witnesses. So number one presents us with a list of all the things unbelievers are looking for. Um, I don't think there's a single one who we wouldn't circle, you know, since the question is circle the things you think unbelievers are looking for. I think everybody is looking for what is on that list. Um, whether it be happiness or relief from guilt or purpose or a way to cope with death, death or a sense of worth, self-acceptance, whatever the case may be. So why don't you t choose an item from the list above, or maybe two, jot down what an unbeliever may say to express that particular longing. How would you know that this longing is in them by, by something they say? And then what would you say in reply to give them what you have in Christ? Why don't you pause the video and take a second to think about that and maybe jot some things down. Okay, if you had a chance to do that, I think this is a really helpful exercise um, because it helps us to maybe be more aware of the things that people say that express maybe some really deep longings that Christ is really good at satisfying. For example, um, you know, if somebody is lamenting, you know, this has gone wrong again, you know, um, and they say, I just want to be happy. Um, what an open door for you to say how Christ has fulfilled your desire for genuine 
happiness. And it's a happiness that doesn't rest on how my circumstances are going. It's a happiness that rests in the knowledge that God loves me. He's given me the biggest thing he could give me, my eternal salvation. And he promises to be with me through all the hard times I face in life. So I have a reason to be happy today. Um, or maybe a person is looking for a way to cope with death. Um, um, we might know somebody whose loved one has died and they are just crushed by grief. Um, we have the message of a savior who gives eternal life. We have the message of a savior who lives having conquered death for us to comfort us in our grief. Um, and that comfort comes from his unfailing love and promises that he will not abandon us when we feel the most crushed in life, but will give us uh, strength and comfort to get through. So in every one of those things, I, I challenge you to, to think through how would a person express that? Um, you know, a sense of worth, uh, somebody saying, you know, I, I can't believe I've made such stupid decisions. You know, I'm just, just such a loser. Um, to give people the knowledge of their great worth to God in Christ, that he would come to this broken world and take on our frail mortal flesh and die for us. So that's what we're talking about with number two. And that leads us to the conclusion, um, which is number three, witnessing became a lot stre less stressful when I realized I wasn't trying to sell something. I was just giving something away. Um, that's kind of important to remember. Um, sometimes I get into... A, a frame of thinking where I think, you know, I've got to be able to win some arguments to lead somebody to Jesus. You know, I've got to be able to present my case persuasively, like I'm trying to sell somebody something. Um, I'm not, I'm giving something away. Um, so when you express, when you hear people express what is missing or what they're lacking in their lives, all you want to do is give them what they're lacking and all of what we are really looking for and longing for is found in Christ. Um, and he gives us alone um, what truly satisfies all of those longings. So that's our lesson. I hope the biggest outcome of this lesson is that you realize, you know, you may be a lot more of a witness for Christ than you realize just by going to church, just by praying for the spiritual welfare of others and their eternal welfare. Um, just by living your life of humble faith and Christian love, you are a witness. Um, and I also hope it has made us a little more aware of the importance of witnessing and maybe given us a few more additional ways we can maybe step out of our comfort zone and be the witnesses that Christ has called us to be with the confidence that all of our um, deficiencies, um, we can go to God with all of those and say, here's where I'm weak and cowardly and um, not very competent when it comes to being your witnesses. Give me what I need in all of those um, instances and areas to help me be your witness and to know that he'll help you. So he never calls us to do anything uh, without also equipping us to do that. And that is true of witnessing too. So that is our lesson. Uh, we will wrap up with prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what the gospel means to us. Uh, fill us with deep appreciation and with love for you and with um, gratitude for what you mean to us so that we may be your eager witnesses. And where we are deficient, give us strength and competency in your grace and in your power at work in us. Help us to trust your word, which we share, and to remember that we are not trying to um, argue anyone into your kingdom, but simply to share good news, to share you, the Savior of all. In your name we pray. Amen. May God bless your day.